Right. I think we're ready to start. We're we'll just let every, letting everyone in. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Anthony Brown. I'm the uh, uh, MP for South Cambridgeshire and chair of the uh, Environment uh, All Party Parliamentary Group. Thank you very much for coming along for the special session with uh, George Eustace, the uh, Secretary of State for DEFRA, uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, you'll see his uh, under the picture. He says DEFRA source, DEFRA Secretary of State. Uh, he's actually sitting in his car uh, because he had Wi-Fi problems at home. He's been working from home today, like I think uh, a lot of us, and uh, he's got better connectivity in his car than uh, at home. So uh, uh, hopefully he won't cut in and out. We did just uh, try it just now. And did um, uh, it did work? Um, it's normal uh, rules apply. I think everyone's doing it automatically that you're mute. Uh, please keep yourself muted if you're uh, not talking. Uh, quite a few of you have submitted questions uh, beforehand. We've got about nine uh, pre-submitted questions. Uh, but then do please do feel free to uh, add in live questions, as it were, if you do it in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, if you're desperate to speak, then start waving around and I'll uh, try, and, try and come to you. The most efficient way is to do it in the, uh, in the chat. Um, and I should say, just before we turn, turn to George, that we've got, um, uh, just so everyone knows, we've got Adair Turner uh, next week at 4pm on the Tuesday, and we've got Mark Parney on the 15th of first September to talk about uh, green finance. Um, but now I'd like to turn to George. We've got, we've got the use of the Secretary of State. We've got one of the most uh, revolutionary environment programmes of uh, almost all time at the moment, because we're le we've obviously left the EU and we're creating a new uh, environment regime for the UK. We've got two major bills for it, the uh, Agriculture Bill and the Environment Bill. And George is going to speak just for a few minutes uh, on what his ambitions are there, I mean, not, not for very long, uh, and then we'll go to the uh, questions. So, uh, George, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anthony, and do uh, stop me if there's any problem with the reception, and apologies for doing this from the car. But look, this is obviously an incredibly busy time for DEFRA. We've got three flagship bills that are uh, underway with um, uh, Fisheries Bill about to, uh, you know, complete in the Lords, Agriculture Bill underway in the Lords, um, and the Environment Bill, um, you know, um, well, pause due to the coronavirus, um, hopefully due to resume shortly. Um, and there's a, uh, it's a huge opportunity really as we leave the European Union to do things differently and in a way that's better for our environment. So the Agriculture Bill envisages the phasing out uh, over seven years of those arbitrary area-based subsidy payments and their replacement with a new approach to incentivise sustainable farming, to deliver ecosystem services, to help habitats to recover uh, and really uh, deliver some of our ambitions for uh, biodiversity. Uh, the Fisheries Bill enables us to take back control of our exclusive economic zone for the first time in almost half a century. And um, in there, in the key objectives are uh, all of the uh, importance of fishing sustainably, fishing to maximum sustainable yields, and protecting uh, ecosystems and so forth. Uh, and that's going to be a critical element of our future annual negotiations, not just with the EU, but also with Norway and Faroes as we go forward. And finally, of course, the Environment Bill, which sets, you know, um, uh, almost a, a revolutionary approach, really, of setting targets for uh, a range of um, uh, environmental measures from water quality to biodiversity to waste and uh, resource efficiency and air quality uh, as well. We've started the work already on what those targets might be, those long-term uh, targets and we'll be shortly consulting with a range of stakeholders to get their views uh, but even though the bill uh, its passage has slipped slightly as a result of the coronavirus and the disruptions of the parliamentary timetable we are maintaining the the momentum uh, on the development of those targets which is the critical uh, central plank if you like of the bill and the final thing really to say is there's a huge amount going on internationally Again, it's been delayed because of the coronavirus, but we will be hosting COP26 next year. Uh, we want to put nature-based solutions uh, as being a key component of our agenda uh, next year, the role of nature, of tree planting, peatland restoration, and so forth uh, in, in terms of um, reducing uh, our environmental uh, impacts in, uh, and tackling and mitigating climate change is gonna be a really important element of that. Uh, and we've also got CBD next year, where again, biodiversity will be a big part of it. And we've also uh, been doing a lot of work on issues such as um, due diligence in the supply chain so that we can 
uh, tackle the problem of forest risk products and ensure that we have sustainable agriculture in other countries too. So a uh, packed agenda, huge amounts going on, but some really exciting opportunities to do things differently and better as we uh, end the transition period and uh, chart a different course. Excellent. Thank you very much, George. We've had quite a few people join. We're over uh, 50 now. Just say, if you have just joined, uh, if you've got a, a live question, please put it in the chat or indeed you can put up the yellow uh, hand gesture. Uh, but I make the rips because I may not see that, but we'll certainly try and come to everything in the chat. So the pre-submitted questions. Um, I'm going to come. We've got a, a couple from uh, uh, Barbara Young, uh, Baroness Young of Old Scone. Uh, Barbara, uh, who used to be Chief Executive of the Environment Agency and RSPB, I know, and is currently Chairman. I just checked out the Woodland Trust. She's got three questions. Um, uh, will the Secretary of State guarantee the protection of our existing nature-enriching, carbon-sequestering woods and trees by ensuring that any trees planted under government schemes, including the Welcome Nature for Climate Fund, will be from UK nurseries, and ideally from the many nurseries across the country that are growing UK and Ireland-sourced and grown stock? Um, well, we're absolutely looking at this. Uh, whether I can give a guarantee that every single tree uh, would be, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to go that far, but we are working uh, with a, um, a wide range of uh, British nurseries uh, in order to um, develop uh, our approach here and to make sure that they've got the capacity to deliver what we need in the uh, years ahead. Right, thank, thank you for that. Uh, and then um, I'm just mixing up the questions a bit here. From uh, we've got a couple of questions about uh, uh, British farmers and animal welfare, uh, a key topic for debate at the moment. So Roger Gale, uh, MP for North Thanet, uh, said, "What is the government doing on the issue of protection for British farmers and animal welfare?" And then I've noticed that uh, Philip Dunn has just another MP has just submitted a question saying, "Last week you wrote to MPs jointly with Liz Truss announcing establishment of a food trade commissioner." What powers will this commissioner have to set welfare and food standards in uh, free trade agreement negotiations? Well, the first thing is that the Agriculture Bill uh, in Clause 1 under the list of objectives has enhancing animal welfare as one of the objectives. So we are looking at um, animal health and uh, animal welfare uh, pathways and schemes that we'd be able to incentivize through the Agriculture Bill to raise uh, animal welfare standards uh, above the regulatory baseline. And then in addition, in the context of international trade agreements, we've got a manifesto commitment to uh, protect that in, uh, uh, you know, in the trade deals that we do in all of our trade deals. Uh, we're looking at a you know, range of approaches from the, the SPS chapter, uh, which could cover some of these, uh, some of these issues to uh, retaining the, the sort of um, prohibitions that we have on certain practices here in the UK uh, on things such as um, you know chlorine washes on chicken which is always a uh, the one that catches the imagination and um, uh, hormones in beef um, those those are there in our domestic legislation but obviously Brazil we're also looking at uh, how tariff policy can be used to ensure that our own producers are not unfairly undercut. How would that work? You don't have to say um, um, well, I, I won't go into too much detail, but I, I know uh, I've, I've seen some of the things you've written on this, Anthony, but there are, obviously there are um, things you can do. We, the reason we have tariffs in some areas is to uh, recognise different production standards and to prevent there being unfair competition. So uh, there, is, there are approaches that you can deploy in that field. And of course, we've also then, um, as uh, Philip Dunn pointed out, recently established uh, a new um, animal, uh, so it's a new food standards commission. Uh, there will be a group of people from uh, industry and academia and trade experts who will help advise the government on our approach to trade standards in the trade deals that we do. That, that was Philip's uh, actual question was what powers will the commissioner have? Well it's not going to be on a statutory footing and so it won't have powers of veto over government. I think it is very important that when you're uh, doing a negotiation the government has the authority and the uh, mandate to do that. Uh, but what it um, will do, uh, you know, in common with some of the uh, other export trade advisory groups that we have, is help to inform the government's negotiating position and help ensure that we know uh, exactly what matters to uh, industry uh, on these uh, particular issues, which are, of course, very important and we're also in our manifesto. Okay, thank you. Now, coming to a question from Tom Fuins, uh, 
I'm not sure if it's on the call. Uh, the UK wetlands are now a fraction of their former extent, yet they're a critical source of our natural capital and provide key services upon which we all depend. Storing carbon, tackling flooding and supporting well-being to name but a few. How is your government going to invest in creating, restoring and managing wetlands as a critical part of our future infrastructure, ensuring this recovery is not only green but blue? Well, of course, uh, yes, I agree. Our wetlands are very important and we've got the, the Ramsar Convention that the UK is a signatory to and an important player in and a number of other you know, Ramsar sites as well, which give specific protections for some of those uh, wetland areas. And I think um, you know, there is potential to uh, enhance and support these through some of the work that we are doing uh, with the, the Nature for uh, Climate Change Fund, for instance, although that's going to be used principally for uh, tree planting, there will be other environmental projects that it could also support. So I think our, our wetlands do uh, perform a very uh, important part, not just for carbon sequestration, but also uh, for an, an abundance of biodiversity and life. Uh, it's important that we protect the ones that we've got and, um, uh, and also seek to enhance them and, uh, and build on them as well. Um, I've got a question about soil now from uh, Bob Harris. Um, the mineral content of UK soils is dropping. What is being done about this by your department? And obviously you have included soil quality in the agriculture bill now. Exactly. We're doing quite a lot of work actually on soil health uh, because this is something I've always been passionate about. Um, I think it's very important um, as we chart a new course for agriculture that we don't see the land and soil as something to be mined, uh, but it's something to be uh, nurtured and cared for and uh, developed. And that is what we will be uh, seeking uh, to do through the new agriculture policy. So there is a objective uh, that is around uh, soil health and we're doing a piece of work now to uh, basically establish a, a metric that will enable us to manage and monitor trends in soil health and we'll be looking at things such as uh, the organic matter content, um, things such as the pH of the soil, uh, looking at um, you know making sure it's uh, rich in biodiversity, simple things like earthworm counts can be a good indicator of soil health. So soil health is going to be a very very important feature uh, of our future agriculture policy and we might even have a, um, a sort of holistic soil health package as part of our uh, sustainable uh, farming um, uh, scale as a part of, the, uh, part of the incentive to try to really encourage it. Excellent, I think that'll be very good news. Um, question from Ruth Edwards, uh, another MP in the chat. Uh, please could you clarify what measures you're looking at in terms of reducing deforestation in supply chains? Well, we had, um, so Ian Cheshire did a report for us on the Global Resources Initiative. Uh, that's made a number of uh, recommendations and, you know, we're discussing that across government now. Um, I'm you know, very keen that we, we do something in this space to strengthen accountability in the supply chain. It's a relatively small number of very large companies that are uh, sourcing um, things like palm oil, which are uh, one of the key forest risk products. They're quite large companies. A lot of them have already voluntarily uh, taken action to make sure that there's accountability in their supply chain and that they are only sourcing products like uh, palm oil from sustainable resources and that there's uh, not been illegal deforestation as a result of the products that they buy. So we're very keen to learn uh, from them and they're involved in, uh, uh, in informing some of our thinking in this space. Uh, I can't say much more on it now, except to really commend the report that came uh, from uh, Sir Ian Cheshire and to, to say that we're looking very seriously at this whole issue. Excellent. I've um, got a question uh, on peatland now, I've got a long question from Adam Barnett. Um, the UK's peatland stores more carbon than the forests of the UK, France and Germany combined. However, the continued burning of our upland peat not only directly releases CO2 into our atmosphere, but it puts the much larger amount of carbon underground at risk as the peat is degraded and dried out. When will peatland burning be banned and land managers instead incentivized to re-wet and restore our peatland so it can work for the benefit of climate and nature? Well, we're already doing quite a lot of um, work in this area and so stewardship work that we do uh, in these areas particularly where we have so-called blanket bog deep peat as it were um, is very much aimed at re-wetting those uh, peatland areas 
because once they're re-wetted, they can be a very important uh, uh, way of storing carbon and they lock that carbon up. Um, there's a, a separate issue then around a burning. A lot of the um, main estates and larger landowners have already moved predominantly to cutting. And um, we're looking at whether we can make that practice go further by introducing further restrictions or bans uh, on burning. Um, but we also have to recognize there will always be some areas where um, the land is very inaccessible, where you've got steep slopes or lots of scree and you can't access it to, um, to manage it and to uh, cut, cut the, uh, the heather with a mower. And in those situations, we'll need to retain either an option for there to be some sort of derogation or indeed some sort of licensing approach to enable uh, those inaccessible areas still to be managed. Because if you don't manage those, uh, all of the experts and people who have experience of managing these moorland areas uh, will tell you that um, you will end up with uh, wildfires um, during the summer months uh, raging out of control. And that's the worst of all worlds. Nobody wants to see that. That causes huge environmental damage. So we're looking very closely at this. We will be publishing a peat strategy, probably uh, in around September, and that will set out our intentions for you know, further restrictions and further progress to reduce the practice of burning on blanket bog. Okay, well, there's a, actually a follow-up question, uh, another peak question from uh, uh, Mayor Garland from uh, Kingfisher B&Q, which are obviously big uh, garden centres, um, about peat. I don't know if you have anything to add. The question is this, can you please give us an update on the peat strategy, which you said is out in September, and whether this will cover reducing import of peat for growing media as well as protecting UK peatlands? We're working hard to phase peat out from growing media, including compost, and already have successful peat-free alternatives in our range. Yes, the peat strategy, uh, and again, it's in draft form at the moment, and we will be doing you know, some, some consultation with key stakeholders over the next month or so. But that does look at the, uh, the issue of horticultural use of peat. Uh, we're very keen to... Uh, to phase that out and to you know eventually you know prevent peat being used um, altogether in this sector i think it's much easier to achieve probably in the uh, garden centers where they um, and the the amenity horticulture sector but um, potentially a bit harder where you're looking at for instance uh, modules and um, you know the veg industry that use you know small amounts of peat uh, for for small seedlings it could be a bit more challenging there but we are looking closely at this whole area and we do want to try to phase out the use of uh, peat in the horticultural sector and, and really want to work with the industry on that. Thank you. Got another question, second question from uh, Barbara Young. Uh, she pre-submitted it. Uh, going, uh, uh, can the Secretary of State outline the measures to ensure that any relaxation and alterations to the planning system uh, to help lockdown recovery will not result in damage or destruction of ancient woodlands? Look, what we are specifically looking at, and the Prime Minister gave a big speech obviously last week and the Chancellor will be saying more tomorrow, is things that we might be able to do as we leave the EU to uh, simplify and speed up procedures, but definitely not to remove protections. And it's very important that this is uh, understood. There will always be areas that need to be protected because the habitats there cannot be replaced. And indeed, you know, ancient woodland is obviously, you know, it cannot be uh, replaced. You can't just say chop it down and plant something uh, somewhere else. Uh, so we will want to keep those um, protections in place. Obviously, it's not a, uh, never has been a, a sort of blanket protection. And there are always circumstances where you can uh, uh, see a loss of ancient woodland. Of environmental protection, protecting things that uh, can't be easily replaced is, is critical. But there are also... I think it's fair to say when it comes to things such as the environmental impact assessments or strategic environmental assessments which are required under EU law some of them are um, they're quite quite clunky quite bureaucratic lots of consultants get involved they're often quite prone to no level of understanding about the science of a particular site and the ecology and the habitats that are contained therein. So one of the things we want to do is to try to build, if you like, a, a higher baseline understanding of the uh, data around 
habitats and around uh, uh, wildlife and um, what specific wildlife and species populations so that there's uh, a clearer idea for a developer of where they're likely to be able to build and where they wouldn't be able to build uh, before you get into quite cumbersome uh, processes with consultants and the like. So we're trying to look at ways of uh, making that environmental impact assessment process more effective, uh, but crucially um, able to reach you know, decisions um, more quickly and with less process. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Got a question from uh, Nick Brown, Nicholas Brown. Are there any plans to extend biodiversity net gain to nationally significant infrastructure projects? Uh, and if so, when? If not, is there a reason why not? Well, the bill uh, obviously introduces biodiversity uh, net gain on uh, local developments, but major infrastructure projects were excluded from that, but principally because you know, they already um, uh, are subject to a whole raft of uh, different considerations. They're not really dealt with just through the normal planning system, obviously. And big projects like um, HS2 and others will have their own um, commitments and requirements hardwired in around uh, biodiversity and offsetting and even uh, net gain. So it's not something that we've chosen to address through the environment bill, but all of those uh, big projects obviously get a lot of national attention. And we think that individually in each of those, you can, you can address, uh, address this matter of biodiversity net gain through the particular application. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Question from Robin Bynes, uh, who actually is Secretary of the APPG. Will the new watchdog, the Environment Watchdog, uh, have the same degree of accountability and oversight as when we were members of the EU? So this is the Environment Protection Agency. Yes. Um, well, I suppose it, it'll have, um, you know, well, no, it's been set up as an independent body to um, basically monitor both the government's progress towards targets but also to hold um, government agencies and the government to account if, it, uh, if there's a serious failure in terms of um, uh, you know, delivering environmental legislation. So in that sense, it will, it will perform a function similar to uh, what the European Commission previously did. Um, it'll be slightly different than it'll be a, a you know, domestic institution, not, a, uh, not an EU institution. And it wouldn't have the power to, um, you know, to, to levy fines on government since that would be pointless. It would just be a circulation of, uh, of money, you know, from one government funded agency to another. But its, um, its role will be similar, yes, in that it'll, it'll have uh, the ability to, uh, to raise a challenge uh, against a government or government agency. There'll be a process of uh, mediation that will probably be not dissimilar to the EU's, um, uh, you know, pilot application approach before they go to infraction um, and then in place of what would currently be infraction they will have the uh, the option to uh, you know bring bring a challenge either through an environmental review uh, or through judicial review okay that's great very comprehensive um, so I've got a question from uh, Kerry McCarthy about timing actually um, if the if the environment bill isn't coming back to the Commons for committee stage till September I assume it's true, she said it is. Um, how will you be able to get it through both houses, both houses and have the OEP up and running before the end of the EU transition period? Isn't it going to get quite tight at the end of the year then? It will get tight. And so um, I think it's likely now the committee stage will, uh, will resume you know, in September. And the, you know, the reasons for that are we've had quite a lot of pressure on the parliamentary timetable, not least because of the coronavirus and parliament not sitting. Uh, and then this is a very large, complex bill, so doing a committee stage uh, remotely via Zoom wouldn't be the easiest uh, thing to do. And on top of all of that as well, there's obviously been some emergency legislation that's had to be brought forward. So for all those reasons, the timetable, the parliamentary timetable has slipped somewhat. Um, it is also you know, just worth noting that the, uh, the, the, the agenda in the House of Lords is also quite congested in the autumn. Um, and so... You know, even if we'd managed to maintain progress through the Commons, I think it was always going to there was always going to be some challenges in the Lords. Um, we would still hope to bring it forward in the Lords um, as quickly as possible uh, in the autumn. But look, in the event that it's not uh, passed by the end of the year, 
we will still proceed uh, in advance of the legislation concluding with uh, the recruitment of a new chair for the OEP, recruitment of the board, and uh, we will set up a small secretariat to uh, support it uh, in its early functions before it uh, is formally established once, uh, once the bill passes royal assent. So the, the point that, I've, um, that I'd like to really get across is that although, you know, although events mean that there's been some slippage on the parliamentary timetable, um, the, the things that um, we need the powers in the bill to do, uh, we're very keen to keep to time. And that's why we'll be still pressing ahead with the recruitment of the OEP chair, as I said, but also crucially still beginning the uh, discussions when it comes to um, the target setting process and engaging people uh, on that work. Okay, we uh, we can't see you anymore, but we can hear you. Oh, no, you've come back. Excellent. I've come back. I'm just going to plug it in, but carry on. Okay, your battery's running low. Um, we've got another a couple of questions about the uh, timing, so I'll just continue on that. Um, one from Stuart Hayward Hyam has just come in. Do you keep your questions coming in, by the way? We've got, uh, we've got an hour, so we've got another half hour. Um, Will the delays in parliamentary process not create more delays in getting some of the resource and waste strategy elements, uh, EPR, DRS, etc., deployed? And what is or can be done to ensure action support the carbon budget timetables and engage investments required? Um, I, as I said, I think it's another of those areas where the, the detailed planning within DEFRA, what we intend to do with the powers in the bill, you know, is continuing uh, apace. So all of the work on designing extended producer responsibility schemes uh, and everything that sits around that, uh, that work is, uh, is still continuing and where secondary legislation might be needed. Uh, thoughts already been given as to uh, what that secondary legislation would need to look like. So uh, in common with all of the other things that we want to use the Environment Bill for, uh, waste and resource management is something that we uh, are continuing to, to work on so that we are able to uh, deploy those as soon as the bill uh, passes Royal Assent. Excellent, thank you. I've got another question about the um, OEP, but this is about the powers of it. So my, this is from uh, Luke Thornton. Uh, my question relates to the principles and OEP sections of the Environment Bill. As ministers and departments merely have to have due regard to the principles and, not a re and are not required to follow them if to paraphrase, they can think of any reason not to. Uh, is it really necessary to have outright exemptions such as those for defence and spending? Uh, yes, I, I think um, like, due regard has a, um, uh, you know, a meaning. It's not, it's not just that you, you can say, oh, well, we've ticked the box, that's that done. Uh, due regard does have uh, meaning uh, in law. So it's not the case that you can just say, you know, there's any reason at all why you wouldn't want to take account of those principles. And in fact, we're working on uh, guidance as to how those principles should be uh, used and interpreted by uh, policy makers uh, in terms of uh, when, they're, when they're thinking about these things. And, you know, it was, it was just the view that if you extended uh, those principles to, um, you know, things such as defence, they could potentially cause a problem there. It's not unusual for there to be a defence derogation uh, on uh, matters of this of this sort, because obviously, um, if something has to be done for defence, then um, it's very hard to to uh, subordinate that to other considerations. So um, it is. Um, they, I think they've been taken out for good reason, and those principles do mean something. And, and in law, having due regard for something uh, is also a meaningful test. Um, I've got a food question now from uh, Andrew Day. This is quite a, a wide-ranging question, I think, it's your food strategy. Um, in light of um, uh, coronavirus and Brexit, how will government support more onshore farming and the use of AI, I assume it means artificial intelligence rather than artificial insemination, um, whilst maintaining food standards, leveraging the upsides of climate changes into new food markets, maybe wine, uh, and whilst addressing food poverty? That's a very broad ranging question there. What's your it is a very um, a broad area, but one of the areas that, uh, that I'm exploring uh, as something we could do under the um, you know, powers of the Agriculture Bill um, is to you know, uh, look at developing something in the space of what's sometimes called vertical farming. And so uh, if, I, if I think uh, forward as to what is a, a good strategy for our agriculture, I think it probably means 
um, sustainable intensification to produce more of our food from a smaller footprint. And that could mean building a new generation of glass houses that are, for instance, co-located with, with other industrial processes, making use of surplus heat from those industrial processes and making use of uh, waste CO2 from those industrial processes to, for instance, grow tomatoes or salads. And there's been some you know, good examples. Uh, British Sugar actually have a very good example of such an operation near their uh, Wisbeach uh, factory. And, uh, that was growing tomatoes. I think it's now growing hemp uh, instead. But, um, but nevertheless, the, the principle uh, is the same. I think then uh, we also want to see uh, a more sustainable use of our lowland arable lands with more emphasis on rotation, probably more use of uh, grass lays to give the land a break and reduce uh, soil erosion, um, reduce pesticide use and try to support integrated pest management on some of those productive soils. And then when you get to your more marginal land, I think we really want to be incentivizing pasture-based livestock systems. So rather than having intensively reared uh, beef being fed, um, um, you know, uh, barley that was uh, grown on land or uh, soya that's been uh, imported from, from other countries and often causes deforestation, uh, let's make use of our pasture in this country and produce uh, from that. So I think there's quite a um, there's quite a lot that we can do, and and part of the the mix, as far as I'm concerned, is trying to get you know, probably that new generation of glasshouse production um, that's producing more of our food from a smaller footprint in a more sustainable way, and uh, that's quite an exciting prospect. Um, we would probably uh, need to uh, hire a few people from the Netherlands to assist in this because we. We have some skills in commercial horticulture, but probably not enough to do this at scale. But it's quite an exciting area and something that we're, we're looking at. That is very exciting. That was certainly a change farming. Is it Bill Wiggins been putting his thumbs up to the camera? I don't know if you want to ask questions. No. Yeah, Bill, Bill is a big fan of pasture-based uh, livestock like system. What the minister was saying, and I just want to say that um, for me, the key to all of this is to ensure that the customer are the ultimate is properly informed and therefore I do hope we'll be doing something about food labelling to increase the honesty and accuracy of what we buy in our shops which will assist everything you've just said uh, by empowering the customer. That's a good, good question. What are the plans on labelling? We, get, we yes. do get a lot of questions about that generally. Um, we, are, we are looking at that. So um, the sort of country of origin labelling and some of the other labelling requirements have been brought across from EU law but as Victoria Prentice committed during the report stage of the Agriculture Bill in the Commons, um, we are looking at whether we can do more by way of improving uh, you know, consumer knowledge and uh, going further on labelling. Uh, we're looking at um, you know, method of production labelling, which I know has been called for for a long time. It's got its complexities, but it's uh, something that we're looking at. Um, and part of that will also be looking at uh, for instance, whether there should be you know, a clear definition of what counts as grass-fed or pasture-fed livestock, because at the moment it's a term that can mean quite a lot or not very much at all. And it's very important, I think, therefore, that we, uh, that we look at this area, um, because if we want to start to build a brand around uh, pasture-based livestock systems, uh, we need to be able to protect the integrity of any labelling that goes with that. Right. Thank you. That's great. good news. I'm very keen to have uh, better, better labelling. Um, question here from Simon uh, Harpin uh, about the plastics tax, which has just been legislated. Uh, under the proposed plastic packaging tax, HMRC responsibility, the suggested method for businesses to calculate their packaging and waste impact differs from the existing extended producer responsibility scheme, environment agency responsibility. Could you look at coordinating these schemes better? Um, yes, and I, I'll give a very short answer to that because I'm, uh, I'm not familiar pre uh, precisely with what the uh, HMRC have proposed, but I will take that away and look at it because obviously we want to make sure that there's consistency in the uh, approach and the extended producer responsibility scheme, you know, we see as being the, the central plank of our future approach to take, um, you know, waste resource efficiency and recycling to the next level. So I will, um, I will take that, uh, that challenge away and uh, ask officials to look at it. 
Thank you. Um, got a question from Deidre, Deidre Brock about the um, internal market. I'm not sure this is a DEFRA responsibility, but maybe it does. Um, you, you have a right not to ask this if it's not your responsibility. Can you clarify whether the UK government in fact plans to introduce legislation enshrining the concept of a UK internal market? introducing an external body possibly with powers to override devolved administration's legislation and creating a mutual recognition regime. That's um, your area, is it? <laughs> it's not my area. I think you'd need to get uh, probably a Bayes or a cabinet office uh, well, cab minister well, to, to look at that yeah. area. Yeah. Like what I would say, we've been doing a lot of work um, with the Scottish government and with other devolved administrations on common frameworks. And so we've worked quite a lot of these up, for instance, in areas like fisheries where there needs to be quite a lot of coordination and indeed in some of the other agricultural aspects where matters are devolved but where it makes sense to have a coordinated UK approach. We've been doing quite a lot of work on those uh, joint frameworks and I work very closely with, with Fergus Ewing, my opposite number in Scotland and our officials work very closely to try to get these, uh, these things right. I've got another farming question, organic farming this time. Um, what role do you see for organic farming going forward, both in terms of greening UK agriculture and also in relation to be, uh, the ability of organic soils to sequester significant amounts of carbon? Yes, I think there is a, there's a very important role uh, for um, an organic scheme. And uh, I've discussed this several times with the you know, organic sector. There are, there are two ways, really, that uh, we could approach this. One is we could say that organic farming just because of its um, natural approach will, will will lend itself quite well to the ELM scheme, the ELM scheme. Um, they'll find that they a lot of the practices they're doing uh, means that they would qualify for those uh, payment for delivery of public goods. The other alternative would be to have a bespoke organics um, scheme um, that's uh, if you like a, a carve out or a, uh, a subsection of the ELM scheme. And I'm open to you know, either approach. Uh, we, do, um, we do want to support, uh, it'll take quite a long time to convert to being organic. We want to make sure that we've got the support in place for those organic producers. And uh, of course, you know, we are increasingly learning more and more about soil health and the capacity of soils to store carbon. Um, Opinions on this vary and, and, uh, and differ, so um, there's no scientific consensus on the extent to which soils can lock up um, large amounts of carbon, but um, certainly they can uh, lock up some carbon. And more importantly, they uh, are very uh, rich in biodiversity and are often the beginning of the, um, the food chain for many other uh, species. So there's, a, there's an importance for um, soil health just in terms of ecological terms and biodiversity terms and some role as well no doubt for climate change. A question now on uh, uh, planning and red tape. Um, the Prime Minister, this is from Rachel Salvage, um, the Prime Minister said he's keen to rip up planning red tape and that species licensing has been slowing down development. I guess that's a reference <coughs> to his comments about newts. Um, can the Secretary of State guarantee that environmental standards and rules won't be downgraded or degraded as a result of project speed and the PM's planned planning reforms? Uh, yes, and as I said earlier, we are, um, we're very clear here that what we want is to speed up processes and improve our baseline understanding with uh, better quality data on uh, species and habitats right across our country both in you know, protected areas, but also uh, other areas as well, so that we've got a starting point and uh, less information that we need to gather to, to, you know, to bridge towards a decision. And um, I think there's also, I think you know, it's fair to say that the, the processes outlined in the, you know, the environmental impact assessments are quite cumbersome and uh, take quite a long time. Uh, and there's a lot of emphasis on ticking boxes and producing reports and producing papers when we, we really need uh, you know, more science and less, uh, less reporting, if that makes sense. So a better understanding of the granular scientific evidence as a starting point is what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, and then to try and simplify the, um, the processes so that things can be done more quickly, but crucially that we keep the protections that we have in place. Yeah, excellent. Um Got a question from Michael Bellingham. In fact, there's a couple of questions about the uh, coronavirus impact and the impact on the 
food and supply chains. The first from Michael Bellingham is, given the pressure on global supply chains during the current crisis, beyond the duty to report to Parliament on this every five years, so that's in the uh, Agriculture Bill, uh, what steps will DEFRA take to ensure security of food supply in the event of future pandemics or other events? Well, we've got a team of people in DEFRA who uh, work with the uh, Civil Contingencies Secretariat in the Cabinet Office, and so we were monitoring very closely the potential impacts on food supply, you know, from at least January of this year. And, um, you know, we, we've done a lot of thinking in terms of, you know, what remedies we might have if, for instance, there was a panic buying episode. So we, we very quickly set aside certain competition laws to enable food manufacturers to coordinate their activities. Uh, we set aside delivery curfews and... Uh, eased driver um, driver hours so that we could get food to the stores that we needed and we've also got a you know a longer term piece of work that's underway you know looking at uh, international supply chains so for instance during this uh, episode supplies of goods from the European Union carried on broadly unaffected um, you know we were somewhat uh, we were watching this with some apprehension you know would the lorries keep coming from Spain and uh, France but they did it uh, showed remarkable resilience really uh, within Europe um, there were though some particular challenges with the um, Indian subcontinent so there was disruption to certain um, uh, spices that we import and there were uh, there was a shortage of glycerine um, at, at one point and we had some concerns as well over some of the um, ingredients and vitamins that are used, for instance, in fortification of flour for the bread industry. So there were some uh, stresses that came, came out of this episode, but generally it showed a lot of resilience. But it is something that we are uh, looking at closely. And um, indeed, in a couple of weeks' time, Henry Dimbleby will publish the first instalment of his uh, report on the food strategy. And that will be saying uh, more about, you know, lessons learned and issues that arose really during the um, coronavirus episode. Well, the, the, the second question is about food strategy, slightly more philosophical from uh, G, I'm not sure of your name, G Morgan. Um, does the pandemic suggest that health and harmony needs to be updated with a greater focus on resilience in domestic agriculture, which you just talked about, healthy diets, long-term sustainability of resources, water, soil, lower imports? lower inputs, shorter supply chains? It's, I, I think um, it is important to note that after we, um, you know, this is the, the second attempt at um, introducing the Agriculture Bill, and we got as far as uh, committee stage last time, and quite a few people raised issues, and so we've made some changes to this current version. So there is now a, um, you know, statutory requirement for, a um, review of food security every five years and that will look at all of these issues closely. There is now a need as well to um, when considering and designing schemes to take account of the importance of um, you know food production so we put that right at the uh, center of the considerations around uh, clause one and the objectives contained therein and then of course a lot of the other sustainability objectives we have you know, link very directly to sustainable water use and sustainable food production, uh, protecting our, our soil so that we nurture them rather than, uh, you know, mine them. And uh, that's going to be, it's going to be very important. Okay, we've got a question from Judith uh, Batchelar here, very, uh, a very precise question about labelling, which you obviously touched on earlier, but your, uh, this is a more specific question about it. Uh, to improve consumer labelling, we need better access to well-defined standards, metrics and vital data. Are there plans to create these databases in the way that they exist for things like nutrition labelling? We need these data sources for a broad range of things, from production methods to greenhouse gas emissions. What's going to be the basis of the labelling? Yes, um, it, it's a very important uh, area and of course um, the, the further you go in terms of giving more information on labelling, uh, the more complexity uh, you get. So um, country of origin labelling is a simple thing to do where you've got a, uh, a single a product like a fresh meat. Um, it gets a bit harder when you've got a pizza that might have uh, but peppers and onions and uh, you know salami all coming from different uh, parts of the world 
And it's, um, I think it's the case in other things such as method of production labeling as well. Um, it's, very, it's relatively simple to do on a, uh, a straightforward product like um, a free range egg. Uh, it gets harder to do on more complex composite products. And we mustn't let the best be the enemy of the good. So on these things, uh, my view is uh, where it's um, uh, viable, where it can be done, where we've got a consistent um, uh, data set that we can reliably uh, label things so that people have confidence in the labeling then we should do that and uh, we should also recognize that there'll be some areas where we won't be able to extend it. Okay, thank, thank you. I've um, got a, another question from Luke Thornton who asked, uh, <clears throat> asked a question earlier. And I, um, I don't know where Luke is. I'm not sure who, who Luke is. It sounds like a lawyer to me, the way he's asking a question. Um, many of the environmental impacts of government and legislation fall outside the narrow definition of environment law, which is a, a point that Lord Eber made at our last uh, meeting when he was talking about government procurement. Could a narrow definition be used for the OEP's enforcement powers, but a broader remit be used for secure scrutiny duties? Does that make sense? Um, I think, um, well, I think that's already um, provided for in the bill and that there's a, there's a role for the OEP um, in uh, effectively being consulted and you know, contributing, for instance, to the target setting process. So they don't simply stand back from that. They are also, you know, engaged in that. Um, in terms of scrutinizing our progress towards those targets, there's a very clear role for the OEP in doing that. And it's only really when you come to, you know, enforcement where there, there's a test that it has to be a, you know, a serious national breach of, um, of environmental law that you, uh, when you get into the sort of the litigation side of it, it's only there that the test becomes, you know, more demanding. So they do have uh, an important scrutiny role and that's, that's set out quite clearly, I think, in the bill and isn't subject to the same kind of threshold test that they need to be satisfied of before bringing litigation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've got, in fact, I think I've asked every question apart from this very last one about uh, marine uh, uh, conservation. Uh, we probably do have time for another question if people want to put in one more question. We've got about 10 minutes or so. So this is from uh, Megan Randalls at uh, WWF. Uh, we are currently losing precious nature-based solutions in our seas, uh, including at least 50% of our seagrass. Could you present your thoughts on the scaling up of UK marine and coastal nature-based solutions? Do you think we need to set a new approach to UK seas and what does credible global ocean leadership as an independent coastal state look like for you? Um, well, we're looking um, following the Benyon review, which um, you know, for those who are unfamiliar, that was um, highly, uh, you know, highly protected um, uh, marine protected areas, and um, um, we are um, basically we've accepted that report, and we will be uh, looking at uh, designating some you know, H uh, MPAs uh, as a result of that. And the Blue Marine Foundation actually did a very good conference on this a couple of weeks ago that I spoke at. Um, I think there is, again, scientists argue about it, but there is a role uh, if we allow our oceans to uh, recover and uh, allow things like seagrasses to recover, then that will sequester carbon. Uh, the extent to which it can do that is a subject um, for debate. But I think there's, um, there's no doubt that having um, some highly protected areas that, uh, where, you, where you stop all activity can lead to an abundance of life, a recovery of nature, uh, and our oceans over time uh, will therefore be protected. We've also, of course, got our, um, uh, you know, an approach to uh, we're internationally championing marine protected areas through our overseas territories and making the case for us to have 30% um, of uh, of seas um, protected, you know, by the year 2030. So internationally, we're also uh, pushing this agenda, having, I think, you know, done quite a lot in this area ourselves through marine conservation zones and so forth over the last 10 years. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, thank, thank you very much for that. I think we've um, asked all the questions. That's been a really sort of comprehensive overview and you've managed to answer every question, I think, directly without uh, actually dodging any. So, well, congratulations on that. I've tried, yes. <laughs> so. Thank you for your, uh, your openness as well. You've been very uh, generous with the 
uh, the views and information you gave. Um, just to, before we uh, wrap up, just to remind people that we've got uh, Lord Turner at Air Turner next uh, Tuesday at 4 p.m. or the 14th of July at 2 p.m. and then Mark Carney on the 15th of September. Uh, this uh, session with George Eustace, we, we've recorded it and we'll a link to uh, everyone in the next day or so, uh, so you can look back at it uh, if you want. And otherwise, just look at the you look at the interior of my car and think, why on earth is he in the car? <laughs> <laughs> For those who is joined, it, like, um, we I have problems with our uh, uh, our internet uh, in the in the home, so I then had to go in the car and find somewhere where there's reception so that Vodafone could do it, and that does seem to have worked. Hopefully, it has it has worked very well. I was a bit worried at the beginning, but it has worked very well, and so uh, <laughs> we'll let you get back into your house now. Okay, uh, George, thank, thank you very thank much you. for being in this session, and thank you everyone else for uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye.